all of the animation in the following scene is simulated. In this shot, every movement, change, slither or switch is controlled by geometry nodes. There's not a single keyframe in it. Geometry, lights, camera and action are all procedurally controlled with the simulation zone. I could play this scene forever and ever and the alien would still relentlessly take a random path to the button's random location to turn off the red lights. Randomly. This video is the first in a series of videos where I build it all. The alien test videos, but not those ones. I know it's an alien, but who is testing it, why they are testing it, and where it has come from, I don't know. Though I do know that they say you should always have a story to make things more compelling. But I haven't had time for that because my dog's just learnt to talk and he's asked me to co-host his new podcast. So if you've any idea what's actually happening in this scene, do leave a comment. Anyway, enough of this nonsense. Let's go. I'm selecting the cube and duplicating it with Shift D. This will be our room, so I'm making it a lot larger. If these dimensions seem really specific, it's because they are, and I'll get specific about the reasons for the specificity later. In edit mode, I'm removing the front face so we can see inside. Now I'm grabbing the camera and pointing it at the little cube because it's going to be the star of this episode. The button that spins and shifts around the room. We've scaled the room, so let's apply that with Control A. Then I'm selecting the button so I can add our geometry node modifier to it. Looking through the camera, I'm adjusting the focal length so we can see everything. OK, open the geometry node editor and it's time to get going. The first node I'm adding is the simulation zone, which is actually two nodes. But just like my parents, they are utterly useless on their own. Everything we put in here will be evaluated on every frame, adding a geometry to instance node, so our cube with four points becomes a single instance, then a set position node driven by a mix node, mixing between minus five and five on the X. It would help if we could see the cube. So, I'm adjusting the camera for a better angle. Turning on wireframe in our viewpoint overlay. In viewpoint shading, setting both wire color and color to random, then turning cavity on because we want to look cool. Now we can see that the mix factor mixes between the two positions. As much as I enjoy sliding this thing, I want to control it with the simulation zone. So, I'm passing the factor through the zone, adding 0 0.02 to it. This is our speed, the amount the factor is increased by on every frame. This gets us across, but what if we want to go continuously back and forth? We will need to reverse the speed when we get to either end. I'm adding a socket for the speed, because now, like the you you wish you were, it's going to be dynamic. In the zone, I'm going to use two compare nodes to see if the factor equals 1 or 0, and a boolean math or node to give us a true result if either of the compare nodes are true. With a switch, we'll turn that result into 1 if false and minus 1 if true. Then, multiplying our speed by this, so if the factor is neither 1 nor 0, the speed will remain unchanged. But if it is, it'll be reversed. I could have used a ping pong node to do this, but what I've just built is an example of a conditional system, and these are going to be our special source we will get to some mathematically ambitious nodes later. But you're going to want to pace yourself. Trust me. We will be using a lot of dynamic values and we could keep passing them through the simulation zone with noodles, but things would get out of control pretty quickly. There'd be a carnage of catastrophic cabling, like that nightmare under your desk. So, I'm going to store them on our geometry instead, invisibly smuggling them through the zone as named attributes. A lady once offered to pay me to carry a package through customs for her. I said, ma'am, who do you think I am? I'll do it for free.
So, I'm recreating our back and forth nodes with named attributes for factor and speed, stored on the instance and referenced with named attribute nodes. Isn't that neater, eh? Next, I'm going to group these nodes, tab out, then add a curve circle with a 7 meter radius, which I'm plugging into the group as track curve and joining to our output so we can see it. I'm also plugging in delta time, but don't worry, I'll vaguely explain that later. Back in our group, I've deleted the speed nodes and now I'm using a sample curve node for the set position, sampling position from the track curve. The sample factor spins our cube around the curve. So that we can rotate more than 360 degrees, I'm adding a wrap node to wrap the input value between 0 and 1. To move the cube up and down, I'm making space for an add vector math node, plugging a combine XYZ node into it and a map range node into the Z, with a range of minus 5 to 5. Now I'm adding two mix nodes so I can control both the spin and the up and down by mixing between two values, an A and a B. Next, we need a mixing loop so we can keep moving from position to position. To do this, when the factor reaches 1 and we've mixed 100% to B, we'll change A to the same value as B so resetting the factor to 0 doesn't change the result. Then, we can mix to a new B value for the next position. And thus begins the button loop, on and on and on. Of course, this isn't actual gameplay footage, and even if it was, who in their right mind would want to sit and shift nodes like this all day? So, I'm going to use named attributes for these A's and B's, then build a system to automate the loop. Spin A, spin B, height A, height B. Then moving to the front, I'm going to set our B values. For the spin, a random value between 0 and 1, using the frame number as the ID so we create a unique number on each frame. I'm multiplying this by either 1 or minus 1 with a 50% probability so that there will be an equal chance of spinning clockwise or anti-clockwise from the last position. Then I'm adding this to spin A. Factor and a compare node so that we only store a new spin B if the factor is zero, then using the same result for height B, which will also be a random number between zero and one. And now, as Nicolas Cage famously said, I'm done with the Bs. Back to the front. Let's look at our speed. I'm going to add 0 0.03 on each frame, but clamp it at 0.4 so we don't have someone's eye out. With the factor, I'm going to multiply the speed I'm adding by delta time. This makes the speed value the amount added to the factor every second. It also solves some motion blur issues in specific circumstances, but I'm not drunk enough to go into that right now. Now, I'm plugging the factor attribute into our mixes via two map range nodes so we can offset the movements slightly. We want the spin to start at point 0.2, and the height shouldn't finish until 1.2. I'm also adding two float curves, but I'm not going to tell you what they do until the end of the video, because you know what? I am a showman. Now we will store our B's to our A's when the two mixes have completed. This will be when the factor attribute reaches 1.2, because even if you're a goldfish, you'll remember that we delayed the end of the height move to 1.2. And if you are a goldfish, I have so many questions. To stop the button moving non-stop, like that guy dancing at the wedding that time, I'm adding a boolean attribute, button on, and if it's false, set the speed to zero. It'll be set to false at the same time as the AB changeover, when the factor reaches 1.2. I'm creating a clock attribute to keep track of how long button on has been false for, so that we can pause for a set number of frames before turning it back to true. If button on is false, one is added to the clock on every frame. If button on is true, 
the clock is zero. And way back at the start of the group, this is where we're going to set the condition for turning button on back to true when the clock reaches 50, which is also when we want to reset factor to zero, resetting us to the beginning of the sequence ready to go again. And here is our continuously pausing, shifting, spinning cube. Offset moves with random Bs that are seamlessly switched to As. I will be making the pause length dynamic in another episode when all the elements of the scene are together, but not yet, because now I'm going to show you how I modeled the button. I turned the geometry nodes modifier off because I'm not a bad modeler, but I definitely couldn't make this thing if it was spinning. Then I deleted the cube's mesh and replaced it with a circle and a plane. I deleted the plane's face, then with the edge loop tool gave it the same number of vertices as the circle so I could join them together with bridge edge loops. Then some extrusion to give it structure and depth before moving it off center on Y, adding two modifiers, the subdivision surface modifier and the mirror modifier, setting the axis to Y. A short self-indulgent spin, we all do it, before turning the mirror modifier's clipping on. Set shade smooth. Then with this next bit, I do not know why I wiggled it like that, but I am sorry. What I do know though, is that I extruded the outer edges and brought them to the center so that the mirror's clipping would make them one. Anyway, for the past 10 seconds, I've been adding edge loops to create this concave bit which reminds me of a biscuit tin for some reason. More loops, more creasing. I really didn't realize I jiggled around so much when I did this, but I guess that's something a lot of people discover when they watch videos of themselves doing something. Scaling the whole object down, then applying it before finessing the hole a little more. Now for the button itself, I created a mesh circle, fitting it inside our generous opening, extruding and shifting before adding another subdivision surface modifier then embarking on the merry dance of tweaking that I think we all understand. That great pacifying state, the sheer bliss, the unquantifiable pleasure of tinkering. Then I filled the hole and used the knife tool to make myself a topographically better person. I aligned the knob in X-ray mode, then added another mesh circle to make the grill. This is the dial which rotates when the button is on. And yes, I realize now that I should have called it the dial, but if you think I'm going back and re-recording all of this just because of that, you have another thing coming. Anyway, what have I missed? Oh, yes, I've applied a solidify modifier to give it depth and the bevel modifier, which gave me these nasty artifacts in the corners. So I changed the angle to 89 and felt really pleased with myself. Adding subdivision and set shade smooth which is something I'm pretty sure someone once said on Star Trek. I added a mirror modifier to the button and a mirror modifier to the dial, I mean grill, grill. Then I applied all the transformations for the button and the grill, which meant I had to adjust the axis of the mirror modifiers because I'd modeled them at 90 degrees. But thankfully, here we are at the last object, the pole. I'm gonna leave you alone on this one. You may feel overwhelmed with all that you've learned in the last three minutes, but you've got this. Then finally, I pulled everything over to the left for a very satisfying zoom in. As I renamed the cylinder, button pole, the original button, button box, the button, button button, the dial that isn't a dial, button grill, then adding a collection to put it all in, renaming it, you guessed it, button. The very last thing I did here was add a cube, then transfer our geometry nodes modifier to it. Everything in the scene is going to be controlled with this modifier, and it will be a lot easier to deal with if it's not attached to any one piece of geometry from the scene. Okay, we all made it through that. Well done. Now back with our nodes, I'm removing the curved circle from the group output, adding a reroute in its place, then turning this reroute into a group. Inside this group, I'm converting our cube instance to a point so I can use it with an instance on points node with which I'll instance our newly modeled bits. Normally, I would use a point from the get-go, but you know what? Using the cube felt more accessible. For the rotation, we'll leave this group, then go back into the button group. 
where we'll store the normal from the sample curve node as a named attribute called normal. Then back to our instance on points, where we will convert the normal to rotation with an align Euler to vector node. For the grill, I'm joining in a second instance on points node because we want to rotate it separately to the others. Back in our button group, this time at the very end, I'm adding a named attribute called grill spin. This will add the factor multiplied by delta time to itself on every frame, which means that the grill spin will start at zero at the beginning of every move and grow exponentially. Incidentally, grill spin just so happens to be the best way to cook chicken. I'm plugging this new attribute into just the Y rotation with a combined XYZ node after multiplying it by minus 1.5 to make it go as fast as I want in the direction I want. Finally, let's name this group Button AP, which stands for After Party. As they say, if you know, you know. And now, everything is moving. But all it's doing is moving. It has no personality. It's a remarkably risless thing. So we need to add some. Anticipation at the start. Overshoot and settle at the end. These simple but magical animation principles can breathe life into even the most rigid of things. Remember them float curves? Well, it's time. Let's start with the spin. I'm going to set the clipping from minus 5 to 1.5 on both X and Y. Then reset the view. This means now I can put points outside of both 1, 1 and 0, 0. Flattening both ends, then zooming in so we can start to shape our curve. A little overshoot at the top and a little anticipation at the bottom, using vector handles when I need a sharp corner and adding more points to control the shape. After the overshoot, the settle, a diminishing wave of points, either fractionally more or fractionally less than 1 on Y, where it eventually settles with an X around 1.02. So that's the float curve for the spin, and since no one wants to watch me do all of that again, ta-da! Here's the float curve for the height. Both the anticipation and the overlap are more pronounced, and this time the settle ends on an X of 1. In order for the float curves to do their magic, we need to unclamp spin's factor map range and its mix, and the height's mix and height map range. These, like love, will set our float values free. And that's it. Our button. Animated into infinity with geometry nodes. I want to say a heartfelt thank you to all the named attributes that made this video possible. It literally would not have worked without you. If this video is your kind of thing, please consider liking and subscribing and look out for the next episode of The Alien Test.